Now that we've established that the majority of the people are not actually middle class, even if they have above average income, let's see the consequences of that. First, the economic one. A capitalist economy is driven by the mass production of goods and services, which are then consumed by the people in a free market system. The more people consume, logically, the more can be produced and the circle goes on. Now, since here we talk about economics and not morality, let's forget about whether it's right or wrong to have a few rich people and a lot of poor ones. The fact is that a country that is structured in such a way will simply be less productive and rich. This is because if you are very poor, it is obvious that you don't have money to go on vacations, visit a restaurant or buy a car. Everyone knows that. The problem that few people realize is that the so-called trickle-down economics doesn't really work. When the super rich get even richer, that doesn't contribute to productive growth. And it's very simple to understand why if you think about it. It's because of something called the marginal propensity to consume. If you are a normal person and you get $1,000 raising your salary, you will immediately start buying food that is of higher quality. Perhaps you might go to a restaurant once a month, etc., etc. But what happens if you are part of the very wealthy? The moment you get $1,000 more, your life literally doesn't change at all. You don't even notice it. It immediately goes into buying more assets like land, uh, gold, real estate, etc. If you make $10 million a year and you suddenly start making $11 million, there is literally nothing more you can buy. You already have a nice car and you can't drive two cars at once. You already have a beautiful house and you can't live in two houses at once. You are already eating $500 steaks and if you eat more, you will throw up. There is nothing more you can consume. And so in that case, if you don't have a stable middle class that is not worried about the future and drowning in debt, there won't be as much consumption in the economy, which in turn will drive the production and job creation down. Now, the argument people make is that if you give super wealthy people more money, they will create more businesses, factories, etc. And this will create more jobs and drive growth. While that certainly can be the case, it's important to understand that it not always is. One good example is Elon Musk. I mean, give that guy more money and he will probably come up with a crazy innovation that makes all of our lives better. He's already making electric vehicles, trying to put people on other planets and help develop an artificial neural network that allows disabled people to communicate with the world. This is an example of a productive use of capital. And I mean, God bless him. However, it's not exactly the norm, is it? Think about a painting made 300 years ago costing $50 million or a piece of property in Monaco overlooking the Mediterranean Sea going from 1 million euro to 20 million in price. How did that happen? Well, I can tell you. It's a bunch of rich people wondering what to do with their money, outbidding each other in order to play a status game. That piece of canvas and paint that went from 100,000 to 50 million dollars did not create more jobs. It did not lift more people out of poverty or heal some disease. It literally has 50 million dollars of economic value locked in it so that it can stand over some rich person's fireplace so he can brag to his rich buddies while in the same exact city, there are homeless people on the street. Okay, moving on to the political consequences. A lot of people seem to divorce economics from politics, but they are actually quite connected. A democratic system is doomed without a stable, relatively wealthy, property-owning and independent middle class. The reason for that is when you have a small, wealthy elite controlling most of the means of production and a massive cheap labor force of poor people working for them without any autonomy or property, you can basically throw democracy out of the window. This has been known forever, even by the ancient Greeks. Aristotle says, without a substantial cater of middle-class citizens who know both how to obey and how to rule, a republic will quickly devolve into a state of war between rich and poor, master and slave. The main reason for that is that with a stable middle class, you have a lot of centers of decision-making. If the majority of the economy is run by a few dozen corporations, their shareholders and CEOs basically make all the decisions and the rest of us, even if we're highly paid, simply obey them and have nowhere else to go. In society filled with middle-class citizens, most of who are self-employed or own their small businesses and own their property without debt, none of them is big enough individually in order to influence politics or decide the fortunes of hundreds of workers at the same time. They will have to come up with a democratic system in which they peacefully argue among themselves and decide how the state should be ran. If you don't have that, you either have oligarchy, like you have in states like Russia, where there are fake elections, but basically few people decide everything. Or if you have real elections, but a massive population 
of dependent working class people, you get a lot of populism and resentment within society. Aristotle continues, middle class citizens bring security and stability to the state, for they do not, like the poor, covet their neighbor's goods, nor do others covet theirs, as the poor covet the goods of the rich, and as they neither plot against others, nor are themselves plotted against, they pass through life safely. The idea is that when you have a large population made up of members who own their homes, have no debt, have financial security, and are used to making a lot of micro decisions about their economic life every day, it is the best breeding ground for equality and democracy the way we want it to be. These people are most equipped to make independent decisions, look into the future and plan for it, because they are not worried about paying rent or their credit card debt and as a consequence provide the foundation for a functional democracy. If you think I'm wrong, go to places like Russia, South Africa, the big cities in India, etc. and see what the future looks like. Another danger of a lack of prosperous middle class is that a lot of inequality breeds resentment, crime and ultimately dangerous political movements. An interesting piece of data I came across years ago was where the crime rates in the world are the highest. I mean in what types of cities. You right now, and also me back in the day, would instantly assume it's the places where there is a lot of poverty, because this is where the slums and ghettos we associate with crime are, right? Well, it turns out the crime rate isn't the biggest in the places which are poor. It is the biggest in the places where there are a lot of poor people and a few rich who basically own everything. Here is what a paper published by the World Economic Forum found out. It says that municipalities in Mexico with lower inequality saw lower rates of crime. The reason for that is actually pretty simple and is rooted in evolutionary psychology. When young men are faced with a situation in which they see a few dudes at the top of the hill living in a mansion while they are barely able to get by, their instinct towards social status gets triggered, but not in a good and productive way, because they see no way out of their situation and they know they are being judged by other men, and most importantly women, by their financial success, the only choice they have is to become violent in the hopes of changing their situation. So basically what I'm saying is this, if you want peace and prosperity, you should strive to create cities looking like the American suburbs in the 60s and not like modern day Rio de Janeiro or Johannesburg. And the last but most terrifying effect of inequality is the effects on politics. I have been saying this for a long time, but a democratic system where every person gets one vote combined with the majority of these people dissatisfied with their lives and with no hopes for the future is a recipe for disaster because it is a breeding ground for populism. Picture this. In one country, you have a lot of men in their 30s, owning their house, having no debt, having two children and discussing with their wives to have a third while at the same time going on two vacations per year and knowing they will retire comfortably. At one point, a wannabe dictator runs for president trying to convince this man to abolish the system and go to war with the neighboring country. What do you think is going to happen? 99% of these men are going to be like, oh, well, you know what? I'm fine the way I am now. I, I will pass. No, thanks. And the populist will be literally laughed out of the elections. Okay, now imagine the same cohort of men cramped in apartments in an urban jungle for which they are in debt for the next two decades. They know they will probably never retire because they don't have the money to. They work for a soulless corporation that fires them at will because of a boss they have never seen just because there is a cost-cutting program going on. They can't afford to have kids and their wife is secretly mad at them and resents them for having to work long hours and not being able to have a child. Now, an opportunistic populist comes and appeals to their lack of self-worth and future prospects by asking them to tear down the system and go to war for him. Do you think they will take the bait? If you don't, let me just remind everyone that a certain German dictator in the 30s, whose name I don't want to mention because I'm not sure how YouTube will treat it, was elected at 30% unemployment rate and crowds of dissatisfied young people. We all know what happened after that. One of the most advanced and civilized societies on the planet turned Europe into hell. This is just a part of my complete presentation I did on the death of the middle class. To check the full version, click on the video that should have appeared on your screen right now.